Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our session today, Post-Apartheid Universities, Improving the University Experience for All. Um, I'm delighted to be sharing the stage with uh, three very esteemed academics um, whom I've worked with in different ways through the years. Um, and I'll start by introducing them. Um, to my left, immediately, is Desiree Lewis, who is a professor of women's and gender studies at the University of the Western Cape, where she previously headed the department, too. Um, her abiding interest is in diasporic women's writing, popular visual and literary cultures in South Africa, post-colonial studies of feminisms, nexus of nationalism and gender, representation and sexualities. Her more recent work focuses on critical food studies and neoliberalism's impact on knowledge production, higher education and feminism. She's currently uh, the principal investigator into a Mellon-funded program titled Critical Food Studies, Disciplinary Humanities Approaches. And this is a program that is shared between the University of the Western Cape, UKZN, and the University of Pretoria. I have to mention that Desiree is the author of many, many articles. We've, those of you who know her work, she's very prolific, as are all these scholars here. But I have to do a special mention to Living on an Horizon, Bessie Head, and The Politics of Imagining, which is her path-breaking book, um, an intellectual biography of Bessie Head. Um, and she's here today to discuss the topic, and we'll be talking about neoliberalism and the South African University. Um, and we'll also be talking a little bit about a book she recently co-edited with Habiba Badarun, Surfacing on Being Black and Feminist in South Africa. Welcome, Desiree. Um, the Um, next to Desiree, we have Yaku Barnard Nodia, who is my colleague at the University of Cape Town, where he is a professor of jurisprudence and co-director of the Center for Rhetoric Studies in the Department of Private Law. He holds a B2 rating from the NRF and is a past recipient of the UCT Fellows Award. In the United Kingdom, Professor Barnard Nudia is currently the British Academy's Newton Advanced Fellow in the School of Law at Westminster University and Honorary Research Fellow in the Burbeck Institute for the Humanities. Yaku's areas of expertise include critical jurisprudence, sexual minority freedom, post-apartheid jurisprudence, spatial justice, law and aesthetics, and Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalytic jurisprudence. Yaku's public intellectual work is extensive and has focused in recent years on Afrikaans literary and film criticism. So this is very surprising when I met Yaku, is that he is secretly, or not so secretly, a <laughs> literary critic. So he does all this work on jurisprudence, but also writes beautiful essays um, on literature. And one such essay, is found in the introduction of Decolonizing the Neoliberal University, Law, Psychoanalysis, and the Politics of Student Protest, which is edited by Yaku. And we'll be talking a little bit about this also today. And then we have Joel Madiri, an associate professor and head of the Department of Jurisprudence at the University of Pretoria. Prior to his appointment in the Department of Jurisprudence, Modiri worked as a lecturer in the School of Law at the University of the Witwatersrand. Joel mainly teaches in the field of jurisprudence and legal philosophy. He has convened and taught a number of law subjects such as social justice and human rights, African human rights, research methodologies, legal problems of HIV and AIDS, and law and transformation. Joel's main research focus areas are critical race theory, African jurisprudence, law and identity, feminist political philosophy, black political thought, legal education, and critical pedagogy, as well as critical theories of human rights and constitutionalism. The central concern of his teaching and research relates to the development of a critical anti-racist 
post-conquest -juris post jurisprudence through which to contemplate possibilities for liberation, decolonization, and historical justice in South Africa and beyond. And he has published extensively in national and international journals on these areas. He's also a columnist um, for various South African newspapers. So to start off the discussion, I want to really start with 2015, which is recognized in both of your texts, the both of the texts under discussion today, as, as a critical point. And of course, we know why this is the start of, it's a, it's a year that marks the start of the roads must fall and fees must fall movements, which amplified nationally and also transnationally the cry for decolonization in South African universities. Um, this movement really resulted in a number of measures taking place and changes in the academy in South Africa and also epistemic rupture, I think a very exciting um, phenomenon. Um, and, and I want to start our discussion here because the, the brief that I was given is to talk about the university in terms of neoliberalism. And I'm going to start with you all three of you, I'm going to ask you the same question about what exactly is neoliberalism? Um, what is the situation when we talk about it? We, we speak a kind of language where we all maybe think we're talking about the same thing. I sit in meetings often at UCT and I've had someone ask, well, what is wrong with neoliberalism? Why is it so? And, and Yaku, you start your editor's preface by saying this book takes the violence and the trauma of the global neoliberal hegemony as its central point of reference. So um, starting with you, Joel, what is the situation of neoliberalism in the contemporary moment in our country? And what is the impact on our universities and our students? Thank you, Barbara. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, uh, when I think about neoliberalism, I think about um, the philosopher Wendy Brown talks about um, neoliberalism not just as economic policy. In South Africa, we talked about neoliberalism as economic policy. We associated it in particular with the Mbeki regime, with the move away from the RDP towards gear. Um, but I, I think it's more than an economic policy. It's a, it's a cultural paradigm, or uh, if you want to think about it, it's a governing rationality. And at the core of neoliberalism is the domination of everything by capital. Um, and the subordination of politics in which we all come together as people to decide and think and deliberate and make choices about the societies and values that we want to live with and in um, to, to, to a society governed by unregulated market forces. Mm -hmm. So what that does in the first instance is that it de-democratizes our institutions and it does that to universities very simply by replacing our traditional mission which is teaching and learning and scholarship without bounds to a search for ratings and rankings. Um, and let me say, I'm from the top law school in Africa, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I just say that to irritate other people, but, um, but, but that's one of the things that neoliberalism as a culture does, which is that it, it drives all our activities towards market, financial, corporate logics. The other thing we know has happened to universities is so-called managerialism as a, rise, as a result of corporatization. It starts when um, admin staff and support staff outnumber academics. It starts when um, uh, academic programs are closed down because they're not profitable. Um, it starts with academics having to sell themselves as a brand on social mm -hmm. media. Um, and all that it does is just empties out the inherent value of what we do as scholars in, in favor of of, of, of market values in favor of economistic values. Um, and so in that sense, neoliberalism both introduces new disorders within the university. Everything is about money and profit and rankings and ratings, but it also intensifies the existing disorders of racism and of gender-based violence and of lack of collegiality uh, because they don't create a democratic space to, to engage those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thanks. Yaku. So I would like to just, um, when we conceived the collection and when we conceived the, um, the lecture that is at the, at the um, center of the, co of the yeah. collection, we um, wanted it from the beginning to figure and to um, 
be fashioned as a installment in a conversation, not as the final word, but just as a further installment in a conversation. And so we asked um, Victoria Collis Butelezi to respond to Jacqueline Rose's lecture, which is the lecture to which everyone in the collection responds. But uh, Victoria Collis Butelezi was asked to respond as the formal respondent when the lecture was given in, 20, in 2017. And um, this is what um, part of what uh, Victoria wrote or said at the time. What we now know, and I will not qualify this with a perhaps, what we now know is that transformation, with a capital T, by 2015, a euphemism for writing racial, gender, economic, and other inequities in higher education, both in terms of access to university and curriculum content, came to South African universities with a twin, neoliberalism. In the 1997 Higher Education Act, redress of past inequalities was meant to be integral to the formula for financing the sector. But the state was not expected to be the only funder of higher education as a public good. While some funds would be allocated by the minister as the state's representative, there was also the expectation of alternative streams of funding, including donations, endowments from private and corporate persons, institutional fundraising, loans, investments, services rendered, income from students and staff for housing. This transfiguration of the South African university into a corporation at the same time that it was meant to transform itself for its own sake, as well as in service of the transformation of society, is not unique to South Africa. By 1997, neoliberalism had spread through much of the post-colonial world in the form of structural adjustment programs. So there we have a very, very um, considered view, I think, of um, why neoliberalism is particularly in South Africa such a problem. We are, we are faced with um, a legacy of brutal racial capitalism, um, racist capitalism. And we have to address that legacy, and universities are integral in terms of in addressing that legacy. And so the writing the historical wrongs is the mandate that is given to the university. But at the same time, this mandate occurs within almost a, one, one could call it a, a Marxist kind of superstructure which is imposed on the university from outside, and that superstructure is neoliberalism. And neoliberalism, for me, is ultimately uh, about one thing, and that is, as Victoria says in here, the withering away of the state. Mm. The state's right that it acquires under neoliberalism to abandon mm. parts of the population, mm. and to right. abandon certain sectors mm. and certain cultures. Mm. Right, and I mean, the, that, that is so important because public universities, um, we are not Monash University or AFTA, we are public universities, publicly mm. funded, and they're supposed to be, first of all, a public good, mm. um, and for the public good. So with the state withdrawing some of its um, responsibility, really, and saying, you go fundraise for your own salaries or your own projects, which is more and more the expectation, mm -hmm. you know, this becomes really problematic. <coughs> mm. Desiree. Mm. Um, Just to pick up on what you said now, Barbara, I think it's useful to, you know, usually there's a distinction between the public and the private university, mm -hmm. and that's a clear-cut distinction. But I think we do need to think about public neoliberal and private universities. Mm -hmm. And okay. we do inhabit <clears throat> neoliberal universities mm -hmm. where, um, driven by market forces, where students pay exorbitant fees. And we see this not only in South Africa, but globally. Mm -hmm. The UK, which had a thriving public university system, mm -hmm. has seen massive transformation. And I think it's important, I mean, in responding to your question, what is neoliberalism, how do we deal with it? It's important for us to understand that it is a global phenomenon. You know, mm. I think to reify it and see it as something distinct to our universities loses mm. sight of just the magnitude and the structural, mm. you know, impact of right. it. Right. Um, just to pick up on your point, it is 
for me, it is important to think about the fact that neoliberalism has kind of two levels. So th there's the economic level, which is often focused on, and which is clear-cut, structural adjustment, and so on. And then there's the more cultural level, which has to do with how neoliberal neoliberalism shapes a certain kind of mindset, mm. um, shapes mm -hmm. people's attitudes about what is good, yes. what is fair, what Absolutely. is just. Absolutely. So it becomes normalized. Mm. And I think for me that is what is most frightening about neoliberalism, not only in the university but in the broader society today, Absolutely. is that um, you know we live in a world where it's normal to think that empowering means getting this car or mm. having these commodities. Mm. Um, in the same way that it is normal to think that in the university, being a good academic means getting a PhD, irrespective of whether you are investing intellectually in that topic or not. Mm. It's about the PhD. Yeah. Right. No. right. So um, it's, it's, I, I think it's really important for us to, and I'm glad you started this, conversation about changing the university by focusing on neoliberalism mm. because we often lose sight of just what's happening at that level mm. when we focus on the coloniality of power which is mm. of course linked to it right. but it's it's huge I mean I teach at UWC mm. and um, Ms. Fass uh, which is the student uh, financial aid financial aid. Right. It's, it, it's become absolutely obscene. It's been uh, privatized, so it's not even as if universities now are now taking responsibility for giving the money. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of, you know, pushed away and, 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 and dehumanized and disassociated. So, yeah, just, just the fact that I think it has entered our souls. There's a feminist oh. critic who talks mm. about the, the way that neoliberalism has entered the soul of the mm -hmm. university, mm. which I find so uh, compelling. I'll pause there because I think I'm all over the place. Uh, mm. No, I think that's really important to distinguish mm. these two strands, the economic but also the cultural. And the way what you said, um, Joel, about academics becoming brands and superstars, uh, some academics globally, um, you know, receiving an email when ICT was down, the internet, and saying, dear client, and I wondered, yes. when did we become clients in the university? <laughs> and, it's, and it's this corporatization um, of the university and, and, and also our students and, yeah. and commoditization of knowledge, which is, which is really dangerous. Uh, I want to turn to the book, the, one of the books that we'll be discussing today, Yaku's edited collection. And as Yaku has um, already pointed out, um, or started to talk about it, um, this collection centers a lecture by a prominent academic, Jacqueline Rose, a feminist philosopher, literary critic, and a novelist, and a professor at the Burbick Institute at the University of London, who came to South Africa to deliver the Vice Chancellor's Lecture at UCT in 2017, and the lecture is called Legacy, or What I've Learned From You. And it is a very moving and evocative piece of writing, piece of scholarship, which harnesses psychoanalytic theory um, to make a moving kind of, um, what is the word that I'm looking for? Um, um, just a, a kind of a case for the students, the protesting students. And um, there are other scholars who respond to that essay or that lecture which is published in the collection. It is a centerpiece and we have scholars like Joel, like Victoria Collis Butelezi whose work you just read from, um, Sarah Nuttall, Judith Butler, um, Luanda Scott from UCT who was a, a PhD student then, um, responding to the lecture. And, you know, in your, uh, I wanted to ask you, Yaku, with, with this format of structuring the book, um, and it has decolonizing in its title and decolo decolonizing the neoliberal university, um, were you, what were you thinking? Because I was thinking as I was reading it, the irony of centering a figure who is from the University of London and then having 
there's a global response to, to it. Judith Butler, people from Australia, also a scholar from Australia. But to have all of these scholars, brilliant scholars in their own right, respond to a lecture by someone who is really at the center, um, how do you figure this within a decolonial mode of thinking? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that on one level, one has to admit the problematics, and one has to be clear about the fact that this is a, a, an intervention that came about um, in a very particular set of circumstances or through a very particular happenstance, um, which I will talk about uh, more um, just now. But what I just wanted to read is a, is a little phrase from the interview with Ashil Mbembe, who we also publish in the book. And he says, he says, this is why in its most historical sense, decolonization is by definition a planetary enterprise, a radical openness of and to the world, a deep breathing for the world as opposed to insulation. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that on an unconscious level, we tapped into this uh, notion of decolonization <coughs> as disenclosure, as openness to the world, as some kind, uh, as, as a kind of um, bringing down the barriers. So, so there they was, they was that. But certainly, um, I admit that it is problematic to center a European a figure as, as feminist as she is, as engaged with African scholarship as she is, to center her um, at, the, at the heart of the, of the collection. But um, maybe I can just say something about um, the, the events. Um, so what happened was that, of course, Rose Must Fall happened, Fees Must Fall happened, and there was ongoing contestation at the level of the university between management on the one hand, in its neoliberal <laughs> um, iteration, and, um, and student movements on the other hand. And um, in the midst of, of all of this happening, um, the opportunity arose to host the vice chancellor's open lecture. And I had been in conversation with Jacqueline about the possibility of coming to South Africa to, to give some kind of lecture. We didn't know it was going to be the, the, UC, the, um, the open lecture. Um, but it then worked out so that Jacqueline would come to South Africa to give the, you, the, the vice chancellor's open lecture. But as it happened, when the lecture was given on the 16th of March, 2017, it was, um, partially, to a significant extent, boycotted by the student movements because it was billed as the vice chancellor's open lecture. And so student movements at that particular point in time didn't feel that this was the right kind of intervention to put their investment to. And so uh, the, in terms of the audience, there was a very uh, diminished audience at the lecture. And so we left, um, and, and of course, we had asked Victoria collis Butlesi to respond to the lecture, so she gave her response <coughs> to the lecture um, by way of a gesture, I suppose, of trying to say, we're interested in a conversation. Um, and that sense of the interest in the conversation um, carried, carried us further. Um, and the sense that we wanted the conversation to continue. And we thought, how would we be able to continue the conversation beyond the lecture that was not possible or that was uh, so uh, severely um, diminished? And we thought about a book project. And that's how this book came about. Um, we thought that we would invite uh, a number of people across disciplines and across scholarships to um, respond to the lecture and the responses we collected are the responses that people eventually sent in. Mm -hmm. So that's where we, that's where the structure of the book arose. But um, I fully admit that it's an irony, it's a kind of strange irony that um, Jacqueline Rose is at the center of the collection. Mm -hmm. um, as much as she invokes 
and, um, and works with black scholarship in the, in the lecture, it's still a problem. Mm -hmm. Even if we follow the disenclosed version of decolonization, that European scholarship is centered in this book. Mm -hmm. And it's also a problem, to be, to be perfectly frank, that the book is published by Birkbeck Law Press, which is an imprint of Rutledge. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in, in that sense, there is a certain sense of failure that also accompanies mm -hmm. um, a project that, like this, in that there's a, there's a kind of necessary failure that, that comes with this kind of intervention. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting. It, it also captures a very particular moment because it was very interesting. I hadn't read or heard the lecture before. I heard about it, but I hadn't actually looked it up. So um, at this moment, in eight years later, and from the, the protests and then six years from the delivering of the lecture, it's very interesting to be reflecting on the, mo the movement from this vantage point. And I, and I want to segue into Joel's essay and, and really ask you um, a, a bit about this, your essay, which, which reflects and departs from Rose's idea of legacy, which is central to her argument in the lecture and in the text, um, the idea that the past lives with us in the present and is um, also the future, right? It produces the present and the future. And... Um, you write in, in your essay, the scene of post-1994 South Africa that Rose sketches under the title of The Legacy is one overwrought by the vulnerable weight of its history of ongoing racial unfreedom and unbelonging. And your essay then closes, it draws on Sadia Hartman's idea of the afterlife, bringing it to bear here on apartheid and what you may call post-conquest, which is a very interesting phrase, which you use, I think, to mean post-colonial and also post-apartheid, but not quite post-apartheid. Um, and, 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 and you reflect on this moment as a shattering, one of the moments of the shattering of the myth of the rainbow nation and the coherent nation. Um, and there are several such moments, I think, in, think in South Africa's history that we can look at. Marikana is one, for example. For me, the arms deal is, a, is another moment where these myths of the nation just are brutally exposed for what they are, lies. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I just, j you, you, I'm going to read, you say in the afterlife, we no longer have access to the conceits and illusions of a reconciled, non-racial and liberated South Africa that belongs to all who live in it. In the afterlife, the centuries-old African encounter with European colonialists echoes out incessantly into the present and lands its blows on the bodies and minds of this living generation as it did previous generations, with no signs that it will spare those yet to come. Um, profound and um, beautifully written, extremely sobering and um, my question then is what now? You know, we've analyzed the problem um, and looked at it at, at all different, from all different angles, but, but how do we counter the blows? Is it even possible? Those blows, there's a sense of inevitability of these blows landing and we see it. You know, we see it with NISFAS, we see it with gender-based violence on our campuses, in our societies. We see it with our unemployment rates we are producing these students that can't find jobs. It's heartbreaking. Mm. What now, Joel? <laughs> Terrible <laughs> question to be asked. Um, I'm no optimist, and, and I'm also no problem solver. In, in a way, um, what, what you're asking has something to do with a question that you also asked Yaku um, about the centering of, of, of Jacqueline Rose, and that in a way, there's something inescapable in that. The loop would be, even if you didn't center her and we centered someone else, let's say a black woman, we'd be doing so in English, we'd still be caught up in another, um, shall I say, condition of the master. Uh, uh, I'm often worried about um, the assumption that decolonization always means decentering some white person or some. Um, I once went to a conference on decentering Hegel, and we spent three days on Hegel, um, <laughs> and so that struck me as a bit perverse. So, anyway, um, I'm, I'm segging into your, your your question because I think it has something to do with um, a question I think Fred Moten asked: um, is, is it still a problem if it can't be solved? Or, or, 
what if this problem seems so intractable and interminable? What if the logic of reform hasn't helped us? What if the constitution mm. hasn't helped us? What if, what if the happy stories of a new reconciled South Africa haven't helped us? Um, people are now talking about the end of the world, and I'll, I'll, I'll get a little bit to, I think, what, what that opens up generatively for, for, thought, for thought and politics. But um, I, I've always argued that South Africa is not, well, the world, but let's talk about South Africa as a specific instance of world. South Africa is not just in a political crisis and a load shedding crisis and an energy mm -hmm. crisis and so forth. It's also in a conceptual crisis. The categories that we use to think about South Africa, to think about our being South African, to think about the history of this place, to think about the conditions in which we live, are themselves in conceptual crisis. They're not sufficient, and where they are, they buckle and bend. One of them, of course, is post-apartheid. We know that the term tries to do too much, too quickly. Um, so <clears throat> for us as scholars, I think it's an opportunity to um, rethink the terms of, of our, how we think. Um, how we study the, this thing called South Africa. Um, the second problem with your question, in other words, the, the reason why it's precisely a difficult, impossible question is because um, here I'm using someone like Jared Sexton says, we have a language of freedom, but we don't have a desire for freedom. And that's something linked to what Desiree was talking about, about the, the soul entering function of these powers, powers of capital, of white supremacy, of patriarchy. Um, so how do we both I mean, how do we achieve both physical, political, economic liberation and, and psychic freedom from, from um, what is now almost four or five centuries of, of colonial violence? Um, that's a hard question. Um, uh, hopefully someone older here will answer. Okay, oh wow, <laughs> retreating into to that. <laughs> um, yeah. I, 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 can I just say one yes. other thing that kind of um, that I that I neglected to say earlier? I think <coughs> that um, one thing that one shouldn't be too pessimistic about is the extent to which contributions in the collection actually decenter without without doing doing so directly, but through their foot through their sheer energy of thought, mm. decenter Rose's contribution, such as, for instance, Joel's. I think there, there, is a, there is a very particular kind of intervention there that is, that, that is not combative, mm. but that is, a, that is a lawful and legitimate disagreement mm. that then functions to decenter mm. the so-called centerpiece of the mm -hmm. collection. Okay, yeah. Well, I should hope that it is combative. Mm. I, I'm not sure why you are so quick to say that it's not combative. Okay. Um, no, no, I, I'm curious why you do say that. And I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm raising this because for me it's a bit disingenuous to, make, to argue that we inevitably center. We do. We do inevitably center, we live in a classist context where if you collect, you know, if you compile a, a collection of essays, for example, you make selections. Mm. You choose people who are literate, people who are, blah, blah. that book is an example. Mm. Many voices are left out. Many very interesting ideas are left out. Mm. So it is definitely not an alternative, a true kind of decolonial perspective. Um, at the same time, one does make choices, mm. and one makes choices within a context where there are certain structures, certain canons, certain traditions that are colonial, that are in place. Um, so to get back to your question, Barbara, about the... Um, <sighs> what's her name? Rose. <laughs> Jacqueline <laughs> Rose. <clears throat> I mean, Jacqueline Rose, should be regarded as someone symbolic mm. who does occupy a very central canonical position, very influential position. And you did make a choice. You could have done it some other way. You could have, you know. So I'm not, I'm not saying this to, to attack you, mm. but I'm saying this because I think we need to think, and, and maybe we don't spend enough time talking about the extent to which our colonial models mm. are very much with us. 
um, I myself tell students you actually need to understand the canon to critique to critique it. Mm -hmm. And many of them will say, no, why? <laughs> um, and in some ways, I, I think actually, yes, in some ways you're right. But there's, there's a sense in which our entrapment within the canon is, is, is so deep. No, um, absolutely. So, you know... I, you know no, I, I, I fully agree. Yeah, I, no. I fully agree. I think um, the challenge, uh, the, the real challenge, because there is the... There is the, I think, the, on, on the symbolic level, there, there is a challenge to respond, to mm. work within the canon, to try and stretch the canon, to, con, to context, contextualize and to contest the canon. But then I think the, the, the real dimension of that is the dimension where you, where you go for the canon in the sense of destruction. Mm. In the sense of in the sense of um, excise from the canon, and um, I think that writing and writing and making non-canonical work mm. is the real challenge. Mm. Um, and we have not gone very far in terms of um, creating truly non-canonical mm. work. Mm. Because we are invested, and this is also mm. what the corporatization yeah. of the Absolutely. university does. Yeah. The corporatization of the university invests us mm. in a particular uh, iteration of the canon. Mm. Mm. And also, I mean, conventions, like this is a question that I also grapple with. We all grapple with it who are located within universities at this moment. Um, mechanisms like peer review, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we know that these mechanisms are also are monetized, right? Mm -hmm. Because for every peer-reviewed article that we produce, the university receives a subsidy. Um, and and for me, this points to um, the, the the need to really think very very openly and freely and use feminist imagination mm -hmm. to envision other possibilities. And, um, you know, I, I, I think about writing yet another academic article and feel, feeling like I don't feel like it. I really don't want to write these kinds of things anymore. Um, and, and have to sit with that. And even the structure of a book, for example, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned, um, Desiree, um, you know, who is it for? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of elitism is, um, comes with that? Mm -hmm. And so, so, so th really thinking through, even who do we publish with? Um, mm -hmm. If we publish with HSRC Press, for example, um, some of their work at least will have be open access without us having to pay exorbitant fees for that so people can download it from the internet how to make knowledge accessible uh, you know these are these are very large questions and questions that I think we, we urgently need to grapple with in, in the academy and you know this also yep. just just as an aside there's an obscene dimension to the the new emphasis on open access because mm -hmm. the fees that right. uh, that are charged, in order for something to be open access is completely prohibitive. So it's, it's, it's in, entirely self-defeating mm -hmm. and um, at the same time uh, a, a, mo a further monetization of our work. Of our labor. And I think for what this is meant for someone like me, for example, I would publish, I would publish in an edited collection like this. I've, I've stopped publishing. This is a terrible thing to say. To, with, with, you know, I know that junior scholars are having to do this, but I, with Taylor and Francis, for example, um, I just don't submit work there anymore. And um, I, you know, I have the luxury of being able to choose where to publish and what kind of thing to publish. Mm. But I want to turn our attention to this book, um, Surfacing, by Desiree and Habiba Badarun. And I'm going to read just a little bit from the preface before I ask you to talk a bit about the way in which the, this was produced. Um, you, you write collectively, or both of you, a Google Scholar survey of black feminism yields the names of North Americans, including Michelle Wallace, Patricia Hill Collins, Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, and many others. Ironically, two iconic black South African women who have been the focal point of black feminist commentary around the world, Sarah Bartman and Winnie Mandela. 
They've been repeatedly invoked in North American-based black feminist artwork, scholarship, and fiction. Yet few black Southern African writers have achieved the status of universal visibility. It is as though black South African women are worthy of being invoked as icons by other black feminists, but really, even within post-colonial feminist canons, granted positions of centrality as intellectuals themselves. And this is a point that has been made for decades now, that we are the raw material, we are being studied, we are um, these iconic figures, but, but not actually seen as equal mm. producers of knowledge. Mm. And can you talk, you, you mentioned, Desiree, about processes of selection, omissions, and so on. Um, this, this is a very different kind of collection because it centers a different kind of writing um, other than the formal scholarly mode. My favorite um, essay in here is by Makosa Zana Klaba called The Music of My Orgasm. And um, it's just a gem and it's delightful and so are many of the other pieces. So, so let's talk a little bit about how this mm. concept came about and what kind of, I know my essays in here, you sent it back several times and said it's too academic, rewrite it, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was frustrated, so. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I can start by saying this was fun. <laughs> um, the idea of it, the idea of challenging, and, and, and you know, I think it's, it's useful to center feminism because feminism um, within the academy has always pushed the boundaries and really kind of provides uh, a framework, not a framework, that sounds too rigid, but some kind of, you know, signposts that we can think about when we think about transformation on many levels, you know, how to decolonize the university, how to decenter canons, how to think about alternative epistemologies and different, um, you know, courses, different readings, different uh, authors. So um, it, 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 it grows out of working with these ideas of how to decenter the center in gender mm -hmm. terms and in racialized terms. And part of that was not simply kind of having certain writers involved, the whole politics of inclusion, because I think that's one interpretation of transforming universities, decolonization. The idea is that you bring, oops, you bring people in. Um, mm -hmm. The aim really should be to question the institution or the structure that you work within. Um, and that's what we try to do with this, which is to think about different genres, different forms of writing, um, essays that didn't necessarily rely on conventional scholarly forms. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's the, the, those are kind of different responses to, to what mm -hmm. you've said, but maybe I can pick up some more. You later. can pick up some more? Well, later, I'm just trying to think now that, yeah, you raise so much. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Mm. Can, can I signal one, one, one impasse that, I mean, I often, particularly in, um, in, in our leftist radical spaces around the university. So on the one hand, we know that the university is imperiled. We know that the traditional meaning and value of the university as a place to think, as a place to contest, as a place in which we experience the vastness of social life um, is, 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 being, is being throttled by these corporatist capitalist logics. In other words, at this point, the university needs to be defended. On the other hand, we want to descend to the university. Um, how do we get out of that impasse? Um, by understanding, I think that the university is only one of many sites of study, one of many sites of surfacing meanings and literatures and so forth. So I would make a case for deep scholarly work as much as I would make a case for, for the literary, for the artistic, for the poetic to come into conversation without the assumption that one is superior to the other, that the one, these are all simply choreographies of sense making. Um, I would make the case for your students to read the canon, not because you want to romance the canon, but because we want to know the enemy, among other things. 
But then we can also just dump them when we're done. I, I mean, I tell my students, today we're reading Schmidt. No, Schmidt was a Nazi, but we need to read him to understand the concept of sovereignty. We're not taking him for lunch afterwards. We just want to understand what he meant and how that particular concept of sovereignty was institutionalized and how sovereignty can be thought about in other ways. Um, only in the university and only in the classroom can we do that kind of deep study. So we have to force Maybe that's too rigid, too violent a word, but we must insist that our students, anything can be studied, precisely because we're not taking these people home, you know? <laughs> we, they are under our powers of, they are under the powers of our minds and powers of our imagination. There is the risk of seduction. There is a risk that if you read too much of something and you like a particular thinker, you get seduced. But study is one way we can resist some of the seductions of the celebrity or the star um, so that we can always be open to, to other voices. But I, I now think the university actually needs to be defended um, as the one place where we need to do deep study and deep work. And, and I sometimes get uh, a little bit uh, discouraged. We all complain that our students don't read, which is fine. That's, that's, that's being a student. But I, I do get discouraged if the student, any student, in advance, resists reading. Mm -hmm. I'm scared of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I also think that it really is. I mean, one of my most, um, one of my favorite thinkers is, is Sylvia Winter, who reminds us that what we understand to be science or right. philosophy is ethnoscience, mm. ethno philosophy. Mm. So at the same time that we are saying, look, get your students to understand the canon. And I struggle with this. Yeah. I want my students to understand the canon because there's no way they'll get on in the university if they don't engage with the canon and critique it from within an understanding. But to understand that actually the philosophy that we come to revere is actually one tiny yes. percentage of the philosophy of the world. Absolutely. It's actually quite a thing, you know, to actually process that and acknowledge that this is, this is the case. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing that you picked up on, which is um, the way that that book responds to an American canon, mm -hmm. is that we often think about decolonization in terms of the West versus the rest, mm -hmm. or racialized terms. Mm -hmm. But they are also geopolitical, you know. Mm -hmm. right configurations mm -hmm. and certainly with black feminism um, the tendency is to invoke bell hooks mm -hmm. Audrey Lord which of course is very important mm -hmm. but also to neglect Puma Gola, Barbara mm -hmm. Boswell and so on mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is deeply problematic mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think it's, it's really important for us to constantly be pushing at centers. Mm -hmm. There's one other thing I wanted to say, and I see we're sort of running out of time. I wanted in. some questions also from the okay. audience, but I think you should okay. say the other thing you wanted to say, please. I've actually forgotten. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can yeah, just, you, you look like you want to say something, I you just, read something. Um, um, Desiree's uh, reference to Sylvia Winton made me think about, again about Victoria Collis Butelezi's response. Mm. And I just want to read this short paragraph which she says, the limits to black revolt of the neoliberal capture of the imagination of black liberation, a liberation for which South Africa came to be a major battlefront, is key to the history of the logic or illogic of generational time of which Rose speaks in the lecture. Um, and she refers to Nwade's idea of the past present. Because if we follow Winter, and then she quotes Winter, the black revolt is the most radical of all revolts because it aims at the code. Mm. That is the black white code, mm. which is the central inscription and division that generates all the other hierarchies. That's very controversial, by the way. I'm, I'm surprised Israel is not getting worked up by that. It's no, I'm, <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> I would like to hear from the audience. Yes, I think that's a good point at which to open up the discussion. I have more questions, but I'm more interested in hearing um, the questions from the audience. So it's, you're all shrouded in darkness. Mm. So I'm trying to see as best. Like, OK, there I see a question. Yeah, is that a question over there? Yes. Great. Um, I 
have multiple questions which I won't ask because what I really want to hear now is the thing Desre is pretending she forgot to say. <laughs> oh, no. So please stop pretending to have forgotten and tell us what the thing was because it um, just kind of reading your body, you, you were just about to say it and then you something happened. And so I think that's a very um, interesting moment. But you're saying no. Okay, so then I'll ask one of my other questions. Are you saying no? I really, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> yeah, really Sorry, I don't want to take up too much time. So my other question then is about, is whether um, you, Des, it's also another question for Desiree. Sorry, Desiree. And, um, and maybe Barbara. Um, because I think that, I wonder whether you can speak a little bit more about um, some of the work around um, not just in terms of the discipline and reading and, and, and different ways of kind of writing, some of the work in the university, some of the work of confronting the post-apartheid um, uh, university that, that the different kinds of, 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 of essays in, 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 in surfacing does. I mean, I just, I guess I'm just much more, I'm, I'm, I'm quite curious about your senses about, about what surfacing, um, the kind of work that, that the particular accents um, that many of the people who write in, in, in surf, contribute chapters to surfacing um, do in black feminist ways to the post-apartheid imagination that we perhaps are not seeing um, at all or elsewhere or amplified in the same kinds in the same kinds of ways. So shall I yeah please do. Um, I think it would be quite useful to take it away from surfacing and, and think about the kind of uh, uh, cultural production or the responses that we saw in the wake of Fees Must Fall. Um, the kind of artwork, the kind of poetry, the kind of blogs, especially by feminists. And I think it was really important that feminists were the ones who were actually critiquing the decolonial movement, yeah. which tended to take a heavily patriarchal form. And that's mm -hmm. something that's often been occluded, you know, it's been yeah. silenced yeah. and ignored. So these forms of writing, these forms of expression were really very exciting. Um, someone called Lee Naidu produced a kind of a, a newspaper that mm -hmm. collected um, these, and many of them were online. And I don't know how extensively this has been archived, but this kind of experimentation with form has been alive and well with feminist knowledge production in the North, Western-centric feminism as well, um, and of course in the South. So it's, it's, you know, as I say, I think people really need to pay attention when they are talking about decolonization to what feminists have done, uh, because they have done a lot. Um, and the experimentation with form is, is, is one very crucial thing. So I'm not sure, Pumla, if that kind of answers your question. Hmm. Thank you. Any other? Yeah. Here we um, I want to speak about, sorry. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a microphone coming to you. Hi, hi. I, I want to go back to the corporat corporat corporatization of the university, of the neoliberal university. And you all speak about the systemic nature of that. Um, corporatization. Um, and you also, all of you have mentioned in various ways the, the compromises one needs to make. Um, so, and I loved how, how, how you have done that. So I'm going to quickly just, if I may, um, so, so the necessary failure, Yaku, mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, the, the, the necessary choices we have to make that, that you said, Desri. And yes, we all do need to make those choices and, and life is all about a choice. You speak about, um, Joel, that we, we, we have the language of freedom, but we don't have the desire for freedom. Now, these compromises, which are inevitable, um, my concern, and, and, when we, and when we commodify the, 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 the publications that, that, that academics are pressurized into producing to, 
to maintain their positions. We don't speak about the compromise of teaching. How much is in the, and I think the pursuit of knowledge, the critical thinking, the curiosity, everything that you mentioned about universities as being a site of this, of learning and, and, and so on, critical. But so often, have, I find, teaching becomes compromised. Mm -hmm. So the students who are the real beneficiaries of the university, of this, of this site of, of intellectual discovery and so on, are, are, are forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, where lecturers are, are pressurized and under pressure to produce. And yes, and, and once again, it's a compromise because yes, we do need to have that, that um, that, that form in order for, for, for the intellectual discovery, but teaching is forgotten. Mm. 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 Can we come to that? Can we look at how much, how much is, is lost in, the, in, in teaching? How, how much less lecturers mm. are putting mm. into the teaching and mm. learning mm. of students? I think, mm -hmm. if I may respond to that, it, it's dependent on where you look. I don't agree at all with you that teaching is lost. It's certainly not where I work. Um, we take great pride in our teaching and it's a crucial part um, of our intellectual projects. We encourage research-led teaching so that we teach to our research areas and that they enrich each other teaching and learning. So I'm not sure what the situation is at other universities or in other departments, but certainly this, this is a major um, in, in the department where I work, teaching is a central part and it, it, is, it is somewhat sublimated to research. I mean, but it's, it is not um, as if you cannot teach or can teach minimally in the department. And we take it seriously. We have, you know, we work with pedagogy. We have discussions about our pedagogy. We, we do really center our pedagogy and I'd like to think that we are a student-centered um, space. But, of course, that's not the case everywhere. We, we see in a lot of areas people buying themselves out of teaching. They can get huge grants from foundations and, um, you know, get someone else, uh, precarious labor usually, to fall in. Um, so, so those are parts of the conundrums, and I'm interested to, mm. to hear from other, my colleagues here. Yeah, about I start? Mm. Mm. Um, I actually agree with, uh, mm -hmm. with the comment that teaching is um, an activity that's being seriously undermined in this neoliberal machine. Mm -hmm. The focus is on outputs, um, you know, kind of research outputs. What are valued are research universities, not teaching universities. Teaching universities are considered, you know. So irrespective of your particular you know, a particular department or individuals valuing teaching and continuing to value teaching, the overall system undervalues teaching. Mm -hmm. And our students really are suffering. Mm -hmm. Our students um, are suffering in the sense that academics who are career-driven really don't want to spend time with teaching because they know it's not valued. Uh, as you say, um, you know, you buy out your teaching. Our students are suffering because fees are higher. Students are really in a bad space right now. I mean, I think we, we thought we were in a bad space. We were. But um, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's not good. It's really not looking good. I mean, I see mm -hmm. students at UWC who are hungry, who can't pay their fees, who are doing courses that they have absolutely no interest in because mm -hmm. some donor has decided that, okay, funding is going into this area. It's a very weird situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is, you know, all this is part of, of this so-called colonial, we can call it a colonial system, but it's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And we really have to work hard Intervene, at dismantling yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, in my faculty, um, teaching is, uh, like Barbara said, teaching is highly, highly valued mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and kind of um, the idea um, in my department at least, is that the senior professors teach the most junior students, so mm -hmm. that they teach first years. Um, 
And I think that's that's a good, and there's also a policy of equal teaching load so that uh, mm -hmm. everyone has the same kind of teaching load so that we don't have someone who's sitting with a lot of research time and no, and no teaching. Um, but I think that, well, that Desra is right, that uh, we are seeing continuations of the conditions that in the first place triggered roads must fall and fees must fall. We mm -hmm. are seeing continuations of those conditions on an on ongoing basis, and it's actually getting worse. I mean, NISFAS has now limited the accommodation mm -hmm. of students funding to 45,000 rand a year. Where can you live for 45,000 rand a year? Mm -hmm. And that is what students have to contend with. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think there's, there's uh, incredible pressures that are being applied onto the teaching space. And these pressures generally come from the corporatization and neoliberalization mm -hmm. of the university. Mm -hmm. And they are exacerbated in our context by centuries of white racial mm. capitalism. Mm -hmm. I saw one more question at the back. Yeah. Oh, it's Vinola. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for all the inputs. Um, yeah, I think all four of the, of the panelists has has done quite a lot in in trying to 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 make to un, undo all of the impact of both the colonization and uh, new liberalism. So so thank you for that. Um, I think that there is still a challenge of um, the, the our accountability to emerging scholars, mm. and I think the conversation must be with uh, emerging scholars because they, they come fresh from school, their parents have great ideals for them, they're going into this institution and they don't realize that my child can either be, you know, um, things can go this way or things can go that way because I'm sending my child there to go make, to go become something. And then I think in this debate, the, we have to go back to the real purpose, the original purpose of the university. What, what is the purpose of the university? There is a lot of traps that you have pointed out. The language um, trap, the colonial trap, the, the economic trap, the um, um, imperialist trap. The university is not a, a microcosm of society. So, of course, have been entrapped there as well. So then, the longer we spend there, the more blind spots we develop for what? What could be? And how could we then, um, what can we aspire to? Um, so for me, uh, going back to that space is the university as the space where there is unfettered, um, un, um, no pressure on, on, on people, thinking minds to develop original, original ideas and alternative ways of being and, and living. I think that is the core purpose. And all the other spaces, there is, there, there is either a boss or there is somebody in, in power. The university is that one space where we have free thinking, where nobody can enforce their things. And so I think when we work with our scholars, we need to give them as maximum space for that free scholar. Yeah, even using the concept teaching, it, it assumes that it is going to be someone who knows a lot going into someone who knows little. Um, so what about changing our conceptualizations to knowledge creation spaces? Mm. Um, why can't we go sit there on the grass under the tree out, outside of that class that, that when you come in there you're already fearful because how, I mean, did I pass that assignment or not? Um, yeah. And so the learning space, the teaching space, the um, knowledge creation space must be opened up and, and our methodologies will have to shift with the, with the way. And in that way, we're going to have new meaning making, new opening up of ideas, new opening up of, of um, students and scholars that will then have an impact on society and not there, just there to come and build their own private career. Thank you. Wow. Well. <laughs> 
Because I know by now. <laughs> no, I'm just saying fully agreed. <laughs> well, I can't. I, I'm not so sure I can fully agree because it's, it's a very utopian idea, Vinola. What you talk, I mean, universities are situated within certain contexts that assume hierarchies, even medi you know, medieval universities. The whole idea of the university assumes a privileged special class mm -hmm. that is exempt from manual labor and does intellectual things. And I mean, you're talking about something that's beyond that. Um, so, for me, that's an ideal, but it's not an ideal that we could think about in relation to transforming the university only. We're talking about a much broader process of transformation. And I think this is something maybe that we haven't been paying that much attention to, is that university's transformation is contingent and connected to a broader transformation. Mm. Universities mm. are actually really kind of quite minor in the bigger scheme of things. Mm. Mm. Academics take themselves very seriously, <laughs> myself included. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, I, I, I like that because it's typical Vinola. Vinola works on um, women on farms and eco uh, eco feminism, and she she kind of zooms into the university and zooms out. Mm -hmm. Um, and she believes that thought, that real critical thought takes place outside of the university. And I agree with that. I realize that more and more as I get older and older that, you know, you can spend a long time listening to an academic saying something and then you speak to somebody else who's saying something much more interesting who has mm -hmm. no formal training. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're over time. Sorry. So on that note, I will, would like to thank Joel, Yaku De, um, and Desiree for this conversation. Um, it has been most um, exciting for me actually to listen to you. Thank you for sharing thank you. and thank you for your work. And maybe we should do an edited collection. <laughs> Why not? Thank you, Barbara. <laughs>